Good evening, and thank you for joining us on another Facebook Live, uh, talking about all things COVID-19. I'm Dr. Jim Heiss, Chief Medical Officer at Door County Medical Center, joined once again by the ever-popular Sue Powers, health, uh, Public Health Manager and Health Officer. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. So what we thought we'd do this evening is uh, do what we recorded last week. Obviously last week we had some technical difficulties and it wasn't on our end, actually it was Facebook's end. All the lives were not working uh, that evening. So what we're gonna do is, is uh, Sue will give an update from the county perspective. I'll give an update from the hospital perspective uh, and testing and then we'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have uh, and uh, we'll go from there. We wanna keep this at about 45 minutes if we can um, so we'll see how the questions come. So thanks again for joining us and let's head right on over to Sue for our county update. Okay, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what's going on in the county and then also in the state because it really relates to us. Our cumulative case number for Door County today is 755. That's up 32 since Friday. We're getting roughly 10 to 20 cases a day um, I will also explain that we are able to follow up with the positive cases within our 24-hour parameter, which is really good. Then we isolate, that, we isolate that case, educate them on doing that, educate them on um, their close contacts, what criteria there is for a close contact. We give them um, information to pass along to their close contacts and ask them to quarantine. Um, and have an extensive um, discussion with the case patient around all of that. So I went off a little bit from the numbers, didn't I? So statewide, you know, just to give you a, a framework for it seems like this is just going on forever and mm -hmm. not changing. Unfortunately, it is changing. The yeah. numbers are, are going up significantly. The daily numbers in August for the state were around 1,000 positives, and now we're up to the three to 4,000 a day mark. And it took the state of Wisconsin seven and a half months to reach 1,000 cases. And then just today, um, 36 days after reaching that 100,000 mark, we've reached 200,000. So that's really jumped. Um, so what does this mean? The data is telling us that we have sustained uncontrolled spread of COVID-19 across the state it's, and elsewhere in the country mm -hmm. also. Um, so that reflects a very high burden of disease. Uh, Door County is classified by the state as very high level, and most of the other counties in the state are classified the same way. There's just a couple counties way over in the western part that are at high level. Um, so those are the numbers. All right, thank you. Um, so kind of the update from uh, the Door County Medical Center perspective. Um, some, of the, some of what I'm going to say, uh, if those of you who may have heard uh, Dr. Fogarty in my uh, live just before this, it may be a little bit of a repeat, but um, currently right now, as far as inpatients, we're, we're in good shape as far as capacity is concerned. We currently have um, three inpatients with COVID-19. Um, we are now up to a total of uh, six deaths since the beginning of this pandemic. Um, we uh, um, uh, just added the last two over the last uh, week, over this past weekend, um, and uh, and yesterday. So we're we, we are certainly sorry um, to hear about those. Um, one was uh, 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 in the hospital in Green Bay, but is a Door County resident, so that will show up on our tally, which is why I bring it up. And the other one was was in our facility as well. Um, uh, as far as, uh, as I mentioned, capacity-wise, beds in the hospital, so to speak, uh, we're doing well at this point. Um, you know, it's, it's been not only a lot of COVID positives, not so much in the hospital, but in the emergency department, we're seeing a lot of people coming in with symptoms that are worsening. Thankfully, many do not require hospitalization, um, but uh, they still feel ill enough where they're concerned and they appropriately come in to be evaluated. And of course, on top of that, we have the things that people usually come to the emergency department for and usually are admitted to the hospital for. And that really is the concern when we talk about overwhelming the healthcare system. I mean, that's, that always sounds kind of overdramatic to me, but we talk about that. And what we really are talking about is, is if the uh, use of resources becomes so high as a result of COVID, um, we may not be able to appropriately uh, treat 
uh, someone that comes into the hospital for, for uh, another issue, like a regular bacterial pneumonia or uh, a small bowel obstruction or things like that, it might, we may not be able to as efficiently and effectively get them treated. Now, thankfully, that hasn't been the case. But a week and a half ago, um, you may have heard me say this, we had 31 patients in our 25-bed hospital. And um, thankfully, because of the layout of our building and having an old skilled nursing facility on the third floor of our, of our 1963 building, we had some places to move people. But the more important thing than the number of beds and the number of rooms is, do we have enough staff to actually take care of those patients in those rooms. We had patients in three different separate distinct areas in the hospital, in our COVID unit, in the regular med surge ICU area, and up in the old skilled nursing facility. And that makes that really spreads things thin when you've got people all over the building. Uh, so thankfully, we were able to uh, get through that. Um, uh, and uh, uh, we're doing much better now. Um, so. Can I ask you a question? Please, yeah. I'm just wondering, not to put you on the spot, but what do you hear from the hospitals in Green Bay as far as capacity this week? Yeah, I, our experience all weekend long, uh, I was on duty all weekend long, is that uh, um, St. Vincent has been pretty much at capacity and full uh, throughout the weekend, um, and Aurora and Bellin are very close, but they have, you know, they have been able to uh, accept transfers from here. You know, many of you may know that we don't have a cardiac cath lab, so if someone comes in and has a heart attack, we transfer them to Green Bay uh, where they can be cared for. Uh, if there's an interventional procedure required for a stroke, things like that, we transfer them to Green Bay. And uh, that happens on a routine basis um, for those things. And so we've, we've gotten some information that they, are, they still remain uh, quite full, but I believe they are in a little better position now than they were uh, last week. But we continue to see those numbers of, of COVID climb and I think, I, I, I'm not remembering off the top of my head the exact number, but uh, it's well over 100 people hospitalized in, in Green Bay right now with COVID. Uh, so let me see. Uh, so one of the first questions, um, is the National Guard, are they handling contact tracing? No, they are not. They are notifying um, people of positive tests and then we make the follow-up calls. And as I discussed really briefly earlier, um, our contact tracing efforts have been um, modified and we're following what other health departments across the region are doing, as well as the state contact tracing team has now followed this model. And that is we discuss the situation with the case patient and help them identify who their close contacts are um, if there are household members that are available and would like to speak with us at that point, we certainly will do that. If they work at a business and they work there during their infectious period, um, you know, we can notify that business and we do that. Um, we can do that without permission, but we usually ask the case patient, is it okay? And, and they'll say, I want to talk to my boss first, so hold off yeah. or something like that. Um, and... You know, so we're able to follow up with a case patient within 24 hours. Um, so the, I'm really making that a long answer, but the short answer is no, the National Guard is not doing any contact tracing. They're turning it over to the local health departments for that function, and we're providing that just as I described. Yeah, and I, just to clarify, someone had asked the question uh, at the testing site done by the National Guard, is National Guard doing con I, I know that you stated hospital isn't able to do tracing. We work in partnership with public health. The contact tracing comes from the public health side of things. Hospital, we, we notify the patients. But what we've been doing is uh, myself calling all the positive adults and Dr. Fogarty, Amy Fogarty, the, calling all the pediatrics. We try and give them the rough idea of, of isolation and quarantine situations and start to talk to them about thinking about uh, who they were in close contact with and what the definition of, of uh, a close contact is. And then public health picks it up from there. So. Uh, I think it's worked pretty well. Uh, let's see. Um, yeah, um, someone asked Door County's public health daily situation update reported five deaths. Is the other death counted for Brown County? My no. understanding, <laughs> yeah, my understanding is that the person, unfortunately, the sixth, the sixth death was a Door County resident, was transferred to Green Bay and passed away there shortly thereafter. 
So I believe that will count on our roles, will it not? It should. For okay. some reason, we are not up to date, and yeah. I will certainly it just happened. look into I mean, that. Yeah. Um, and from time to time, our numbers will vary with the states for a variety of reasons. And a lot of it is because we're human, and some of it is we don't get the data in a timely manner. Right. Um, we may have not gotten the report from St. Vincent's, and, you know, uh, we, exactly. can't, we can't dream this up, right? Right, right. I, I'm not sure on this particular case. Um, then Kelly asks, are people with symptoms being treated with anything early on or not until the symptoms get quite bad? And the answer to that is, is really there, there is no, there is no um, I want to be careful how I say this, because there, there's really no active treatment for COVID-19. There are things that we do if someone's in the hospital that... Um, have been shown to perhaps be helpful. Uh, so when someone is at home and so, or someone comes down with symptoms of COVID-19, one of the common things I've heard a lot of people say is they feel just horrible, you know, body aches and extreme fatigue um, and things like that. Not so much shortness of breath, although that's the concern. If someone ends up in the hospital, and so in those cases, uh, it's just rest and making sure you keep taking adequate fluids. That's and, and avoid try to try to isolate yourself so that you aren't spreading it to anybody else. When someone enters the hospital and needs to be admitted, if their oxygen level is at a certain level, um, we will uh, then treat people with remdesivir, which is a antiviral medication um, that is a five-day course. It can be a ten-day course if if, the, if a person is not getting better. The 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 studies behind that are really kind of mixed at this point. So far, they're not harmful. What it shows that remdesivir does is it maybe decreases hospital length of stay about three to four days. It does not improve survival at all. Um, so there's a big question right now as to, is it even worth it? Um, and thankfully, there's really no downside to giving it. So we are, we actively use remdesivir, but it's a big question. The other thing that we'll treat people with is convalescent plasma, blood plasma that has antibodies from uh, someone who has had uh, um, COVID b before. Uh, and that too, same kind of thing. We're not really sure how effective that is. And I know that sounds all kind of gloom and doom, but I can tell you if somebody comes in the hospital, chances are good they're going to get remdesivir, convalescent plasma, and if their oxygen level is low enough, they're going to get dexamethasone, which is a steroid. Those three things are the same things that the president was treated with. Um, the thing that is different with the president is he was given this uh, polyclonal antibody from a company called Regeneron. That is still um, an investigative treatment right now, and it's still going through different trials, and so that's not available to, to you know, usual hospitals. But otherwise, the same treatment the president got is what we're treating people with. And we see varying degrees of, of whether or not it helps uh, or not. So that was kind of a long-winded answer, but I... I kind of, I think it helps to people understand how, you know, this actually, how the treatments may or may not help. I've had people ask me um, how acutely ill people are in the hospital. I mean, I know early on you said those were the sickest patients you'd taken care of yeah. in your career. Mm -hmm. um, is yeah. it looking the same? Right now, when people come in the hospital, most, most often what we're seeing is that people come in short of breath and their oxygen levels are low requiring supplemental oxygen. And that usually is the first kind of warning sign that, okay, something, th this may not go well. And so we get people in, we give them supplemental oxygen, we treat them with the steroids, and we do those things. And very often, um, the, the, the majority of people that we've had in the hospital have been in for their five-day remdesivir course, and they've been able to be successfully discharged. Other people, depending on age, comorbidities, things like that, um, the the uh, uh, infection has a lot of other things that can that can uh, cause problems in the body. It tends to make the body more prone to clotting. So blood clots in the lung, blood clots in the brain, things like that can happen. Um, we see a lot of um, what we're, we're kind of calling COVID fog, a lot of uh, confusion and things like that that people that have severe COVID disease will develop. And so, unfortunately, if a person is elderly, has a lot of issues, um, their body doesn't have the reserve it otherwise should have, and that's what can cause the fatalities. So that's what we've been seeing. Let's see. I'm not sure I understand this question. Um,
Someone said, is it true they're doing free COVID testing at the fire station? Yeah, today yes. it was. <laughs> and then what, how, how can you, I'll look at I, questions. You can answer that question. Yes. So every Monday through December 7th, the National Guard will be here doing testing. And I say here, I mean Door County. Um, last week they were in Sister Bay, and they'll be there every other week. This week, today they were 8 to 4 at the Sturgeon Bay Fire Department, and they will be back there in two weeks. So alternating Sister Bay Fire Station and Sturgeon Bay Fire Station. And I don't know how many tests were done today. I know that I checked in with Dan Kane, emergency manager, about 11 this morning, and he said they were really busy, whatever that means. Okay, well, that's uh -huh. good. Yeah. I kind of suspected that given that this is the more populous part of the county that it would be a little bit busier than yeah. Open Door had Yeah, been. I, I so. wonder if that'll t give you a breather every other Monday. We'll see. Who knows, right? I, I know I've, I've called over 30 people today with positives, which has been a busier day. It's yes. been the second busiest yes. day of calling positives. Um, here's a question that I, I appreciate, Renee, you, you uh, uh, clarifying. Um, the, uh, she's asking the question, it looks like on the tracker that, 30, that a, a patient is not shown recovered until they're 30 days out. Right. Is that, and then she's asking if we say they, they're isolated for 10, is it a CDC recommendation or a state recommendation? What's the story with the 30 days? It's, yeah, it's the model that's been used across the state. And what we found was that we were, we were using two weeks and that was no longer working and we had to do a lot of figuring out who was taking longer and who was um, taking was within the two-week parameter and so to make it consistent we changed it to go along with what others are doing across the region and the state and just made it up 30 days okay. for for recovery so that's the rationale uh, let's see um, someone asked the question without giving details can you disclose that the two deaths had underlying conditions pretty much I think the the, the answer in a general sense with a lot of things in, in medicine is um, so the answer is yes, they had underlying conditions. I think, uh, and that, that tends to be what um, helps, I guess, helps the virus do, its, do the dirty deed that it does because the body doesn't have reserve. This is the same for other infections too. This is the same for if someone comes in and has a urinary tract infection and they happen to have lung disease and they have dementia and they have other things like that and someone develops what they call sepsis, which is um, uh, an overwhelming infection that can cause you get a bacteria in your bloodstream, things like that. If you're a young person and you develop sepsis, chances are you're going to have the reserve to fight it off. Not always, but you'll have the reserve with treatment to take care of it. If you have multiple comorbidities, your chance of dying from a, a disease like sepsis um, is, is higher. So it really is no different with COVID. I know there was something out for a while that was saying, see, there's really no... There's, really, there's very few actual COVID deaths. People have other things going on. And that, to me, is an ignorant way to look at it because so often, if you're pretty healthy, you can fight off a lot. If, you, if you've got a lot of other problems, diabetes, things like that, it's going to be tougher for you to fight anything off. Uh, let's see. Carrie asks, do you recommend helping our immune systems get stronger with vitamins such as D3, C, and zinc, especially with cold and flu season beginning? Um, I'll just answer that real quick unless you have an opinion. I'll let you answer it real okay. quick. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just don't want to keep It's going. a very personal question. It, yeah, yeah, I mean, it, you know, the, the bottom line with those is, is the studies that are out there show that none of those really do much of anything. Um, but the other good news is that really vitamin D, C, and zinc are, are pretty harmless. And so vitamin C is a great example is that if you take vitamin C and help in hopes that it will decrease the severity of a cold or some kind of a bug, if your body doesn't need it, you'll just, it'll just come out in your urine, you'll pee it out basically. Um, so it's never a bad, it's, I would say it's never a bad thing, but um, unfortunately there's just not good data that, that's out there, repeatable data that shows that it really has a positive or negative effect one way or the other. I think it's a good idea for all of us to do whatever we can to stay healthy. And if, you know, for whatever reason you feel personally that that would benefit you, I would, I would say go for it. Yeah, that's a good yeah. answer. Yeah. I will say, though, too, I think to, to add on to that, I think if, if a person, if you're like me who sits here with my can of Coke off screen, um, if you're like me and you're not all that healthy, um, there ain't no number of vitamins I can take that are all of a sudden going to make me healthy if I get sick. 
So that's, that's the thing to realize is if you, li if, you, if you live a generally healthy life and you get good exercise and you eat a balanced diet and you're not horribly overweight, I think you're going to do better in a general sense anyhow. Um, here's one you can ask, you can answer. How are our bars doing? Are most being compliant? Um, went to pick up a carryout and people are sitting next to each other without, without masks. Have you heard anything? Any? We have not had any particular complaints um, regarding bars, but um, I don't go in bars because right, right. I think they're high risk. So um, I guess that's not much of an answer. But that's the information I have. But we I think, haven't gotten particular complaints. So yeah, you, people aren't calling yeah. you and saying, oh, this is terrible. This, no. I, I, we got asked that question in the last Facebook Live, too, as yeah. are people reporting things. And I don't think that's happening so They're much. reporting things, but there's a, not a particular trend. Um, and when they do report something, we will follow up with that business. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I will say, I don't go to bars either. Um, but but I, you know, I'm talking to enough people in the community. I mean, I think, you know, it would be really nice if people would understand that going into a bar without masks on and drinking does not the, the the booze you're drinking does not somehow it doesn't work as an antiseptic and somehow make you less susceptible um you know um we have people that uh, that i've taken care of that have not done very well at all and it was directly related to the fact that they had gone into bars multiple times mm -hmm. without a mask on so mm -hmm. i think it's just not smart to be in any and it doesn't, let's just take the word bar out of it I think any venue where you're close together, not wearing masks, poor ventilation, um, that's a place where all you got to do is get one person there with virus and it will find its way around a number of people in that, in that bar. And if you get the wrong person that has medical comorbidities, um, already is a smoker, already has emphysema, that person may not do very well. So I think that's important um, to recognize. Um, if we want to donate blood, is it screened for COVID antibodies? Does anyone know of upcoming blood drives? And someone answered St. Peter's tomorrow, nine to three. I think they do screen for COVID antibodies. I think they do, but I, I, I so I'm looking at there, you. <laughs> there, there is a facility, and I'm trying to remember the exact name that's in the Fox Valley that does um, and they're looking for people who have had COVID to donate plasma yeah and I want to say it's community blood center or something like that um, that might not be the exact name it's somewhere in the Fox Valley that's pretty vague too but there is a place and yeah. I don't know about the Red Cross if they routinely yeah. screen Memory serves. I'd heard that they were, but I don't. I don't quote me on that because I just don't yeah. remember. So now I wonder too. Yeah. <clears throat> Someone had asked a question. Holly had asked a question specifically, which I thought I did. So they, they, um, without giving details, a simple yes or no. The answer is yes. I thought I had answered that already, but that should hopefully be unambiguous. Um, let's see. American Red Cross screens all donations for antibodies and the results are sent to you. Thank you, Amy. Appreciate that. All right. Um, here's one that's funny. We were just talking about this. Why is the health department tracking probable cases now? What's the benefit? Okay. So I'm going to try to keep this not too complicated, but it is kind of complicated <laughs> even in my mind. So there's several different kinds of testing. Um, and, and two different ways that somebody could be a probable case. The, the easiest to understand is if um, you are a close contact of a diagnosed COVID case and you develop symptoms, we would classify you as a probable case. And we would urge you to get tested. And if you tested positive, well, then you'd be a confirmed case. To be a confirmed case, you need to be tested with a PCR testing or the, um, NAAT test. Um, there's another kind of test called antigen, and the state tells us to classify those tests as probable because in certain situations they are not as reliable. Do you have more to add? No, I think that's about it. I know antigen testing is one of those things we um, pretty much, if you go to Aurora Clinic, that's what they're using is antigen testing. Um, they're, they're around all over the place because the, the state has actually made available these antigen tests. And a lot of us, 
that are looking at these things on a day-to-day -day basis, we're, we're trying to decide the best way to use these because um, they, what, we, what we're told based on CDC guidance, I believe it's CDC and DHS, is that if a person uh, has symptoms and you swab them and you check for antigens or the antigen itself, it's, uh, it, you can believe the result. That hasn't always been the case. So this is like anything else. Whenever we test, it's sort of how, how sensitive is the test, how specific is the test. How can we be sure that if you have it, it will pick it up? And how can we be sure that it will not pick up something else? The something else is how specific it is. The PCR test, the genetic tests, are 100% specific, which means that it will never tell you you have a positive test because there's some other coronavirus or some other virus. It will only test positive if there's SARS-CoV-2, the current um, coronavirus that we're all talking incessantly about. Um, so we're still trying to work through um, what to do with antigen testing. Um, so I guess that's, that's my best, best answer. Right. Here's one, Sue. Um, as we approach Thanksgiving, as families if families practice good isolation practices and test negative for COVID prior to gathering, can it be safe to gather? If so, what's the recommended time to isolate and be safe? How would you address that? Wow. That's a lot to unpack. Yeah. Well, I'm just going to go back to what Dr. Hayes said earlier, that spread occurs most easily with people in prolonged, poorly, poorly ventilated, um, close proximity, and especially if you're protection-free, if you don't wear masks. All right. So as far as all the logistics of testing and quarantining, um, that would get really you know, complicated, but I, I guess you could try to plan it out. Um, and then it all depends on how well you quarantine, mm -hmm. um, how well you truly are not exposed to others. Um, and, and I bring that up only, I, I'm just remembering a conversation I had last weekend with a good friend of mine who does not live in Door County, but um, we connect from time to time, and she was talking about how um, careful they've been, um, haven't gone anywhere, haven't done anything. Um, but by the way, she just happened to go to a, f a funeral yesterday where there was 100 people. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, she seemed to think that was okay. Right. Um, and it, it didn't sound okay at all, the way she described it. Um, it's it's very hard for us to stay home and not go places. And I was just in my mind not understanding why a funeral during a pandemic would have a hundred people. Um, yeah. You know, and I, I I understand we're all tired of this and we feel we have to do things. Um, what we're seeing, um, where are we seeing spread? Is still any type of gathering, whether it's family, friends, um, and I think I heard you say in the previous Facebook, it doesn't matter if you're um, related, it's whether or not you s share a household, yeah. right? If you don't share a household, then it's a new exposure. Um, any groups, not necessarily large groups, going to the bars, um, weddings, there's still a lot of large weddings going on. Um, my contact tracing staff kind of keep track of those and, and anticipate when we're going to get busier. Um, and, and sometimes we are, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, household spread's a given. If somebody yeah. has it in the household, it's, it's tough. Yeah, and I think um, you know, Thanksgiving and Christmas are going to be tough this year. Yeah. I think, yeah. you know, and, and um, you know, I certainly won't sit here and tell people you shouldn't do this or you shouldn't do that. Not at all. But I think it's just having the recognition that um, getting together indoors, um, uh, close together, there's, there's risk there. Mm -hmm. Not that, I mean, there's risk with everything, but I think you have to sort of determine, I use this example and I'll say it again for those that might not have heard it for the last one. Um, the example is my parents are both 81 years old. My mother has a chronic lung disease. Um, so we've already told, I, I was just, my mom just had surgery. I was just there visiting her and making sure she was okay. And, and I told her much to her chagrin that we will not be there for Thanksgiving. And we will, we will be around at Christmas to visit, but not when the rest of the family is there. And I encouraged her to make sure she doesn't have the rest of the family there. Reason being is everyone has the best of intentions and nobody would knowingly go there uh, with an infection. But the problem is you can have no symptoms at all through the entire course of this. 
um, or it's most infective before the symptoms even show up. So if my mother, as an example, were to get it, that'd be all she wrote for her. So I think this is one of those times where, you know, I think it's not worth going to share turkey um, for that, not to make light of it. But I think, so, so again, that's just, that's the conversation that I've had internally with myself, with my wife, with our family, um, and everyone has to have those similar conversations. But as Sue just mentioned, I, 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 I really do think that people had this idea that, well, we're related, so it should be fine. And it really has to do with, it's the people with, the only people that you're safe to be around, 100% safe as far as the, the, uh, the source of, the, the threat of infection are the people with whom you live. That's it. Someone comes from out from somewhere else, you know, a block away, a mile, you know, 10 miles away, 100 miles away, they could have an infection and could spread it. So, uh, let's see. If someone asked the question, why is Door County not testing COVID on weekends? Well, it has a lot to do with um, just having the staff to do it. Um, everyone at, at uh, the hospital at, at Door County Medical Center is working you know, at or beyond capacity um, with very few days off, things like that. Even with our relatively low number of hospitalizations, it's been just crazy as far as our testing site, um, all the things that surround that. And so that's kind of why we haven't been testing. And generally speaking, those couple days aren't going to make or break much. So we've opted not to do that. If we had unlimited resources, unlimited people, um, we would test all the time. Uh, but unfortunately, we don't. So that, that's the best way we're managing it uh, right now. When there's a lull, I have a message from my contact tracing team. Yeah. Should I give that now? Please, yeah. So actually, well, I say contact tracing team. They are the ones that follow up with the case, positive cases, so the you know, disease cases. Um, and contact tracing is a term I guess we've been using loosely surrounding all follow-ups. But um, what they're seeing and what they're really concerned about um, this week is that people um, are finding the quarantine for 14 days really challenging and have the idea that if they get tested somewhere in there, they're good to go back to work, mm -hmm. which isn't the case at all. You can test negative today during your quarantine period and then actually be positive and test positive tomorrow. So anywhere in that window of the 14 days, the viral load from COVID could become high enough to make you infectious and allow you to test positive. And therefore, we really want you to quarantine for 14 days so we don't spread this. Um, we really need to get a handle on it and decrease the cases. And I know that's hard to stay home for 14 days. Um, and it's not arbitrary. I mean, the 14 nope. days isn't, a, isn't a, a, a amount of time that was made up. It really has to do with the life cycle and the infectivity time period of this virus. And so that's why, as, as Sue mentioned, you know, if, if you say, well, I'm going to get tested somewhere in there, and if it's negative, well, I'm good. Well, no, you could be positive the next day mm -hmm. um, because you've been exposed. And so that's, that's why. I think if we take this all back to what are, we, what are we trying to accomplish through this whole thing? What are we trying to accomplish? We are trying to accomplish getting back to the way life was before COVID-19 hit the scene. And in order to do that, what we have to do is we have to get the cases low enough to the point where um, we can start to go back about our business. And if there happens to be an outbreak, we can tamp that down and address that outbreak, isolate the people that have to be isolated and move on. Once we get there, we're pretty much back to being able to have concerts and things like that. We're a long way from there, unfortunately, and the hope is that when the vaccine comes out early in 2021 and when, it, when that finally comes, the hope is that over the course of time, it'll take a while to vaccinate the whole population. We'll get to that point where the numbers are so low that if there's little outbreaks, we can tamp those down. So I think people like Sue and myself, we do these Facebook Lives, and part of our plea is, is uh, if we could just all do our part to not go out and go to bars and not uh, avoid wearing masks and all those sorts of things. If we could just do that for a short time, we could get back quicker to what I think is a, a, a bigger, sem a normal semblance of life, wouldn't you say? Yes, so. <laughs> you said it well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I know people have said to me, um, I've, I'm just sick of this COVID. And I'm like, you know, like I'm not. I mean, it's like <laughs> I, I, you know... And I, I sort of say to people, and I tend to joke a lot, 
But uh, I sort of say, you know, trust me when I say you are nowhere near as sick of COVID as I am. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, this has been my life and your life for, mm -hmm. what, eight months, nine months now? Um, here's a good, Kelly asked the question, um, can you give us a percentage of asymptomatic positive cases in Door County? And I, we, we don't really track it that way, right? I mean, no, we don't. And those are, we talked about it earlier in the, in the previous one, and I think you and I have talked about it in previous Facebook Lives. I wish I had had the wherewithal to, when this whole thing started, to start saying, oh, okay, let's ask if they were masking. Of course, at the beginning of this, we were telling people not to mask, so we wouldn't have asked that question. But, you know, if we had just asked the question, are you masked or not? Um, do you have symptoms or not? And mark that all down. That would have been great. And unfortunately, I just didn't have the wherewithal to, or the, the presence of mind to, to think to do that. So, good question. Um, what do you we, think about we, this one, Sue? I'll, oh, sorry, I'll just ahead. comment. We do um, mark that on our state report. So at some point, you know, the state may report that out percentage. Um, oh yeah. Not sure. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I think we don't really test asymptomatic patients unless they're, you know, if they're a close contact, we'll test them. And so that's the other thing that makes it more interesting is you, we don't, if you're, if you're asymptomatic, we don't test. Now, I know that Prevea uh, down in, the Green Bay, in Green Bay and their areas, um, they were given approval by the state to test widely asymptomatic uh, people. And the reason that they got to get approval is because we're still not, I mean, you can probably speak better to that as to why we can't, but we have to get approval. They got approval, and the goal is is our percent positivity is so high at, that indicates we're not testing enough. And we're not testing enough, contrary to what you might have heard, like the president say, we're not testing to try and get more cases. We're trying to test more to see the penetration of where things are, and again, how we can move to tamp things down mm -hmm. and control it better. <coughs> Should we be doing mandatory testing in light of the situation I just described with my mother? No symptoms. Um, again, same thing. I mean, it, it's, it's hard to know, you know, if you test randomly, uh, it, it helps more for population studies. It doesn't help you make a decision. So I know I'm always, I'm always a little mystified, I will admit, and people that are smarter than me can probably speak to this. But, you know, when I hear a politician say, well, I'm not going to wear a mask because I was tested and I tested negative. That's sort of missing the whole. That misses the point. So it, it's not. It's okay. So you're so you're you're negative. Assuming you believe the test, it's negative. Um, it doesn't mean that you couldn't get it from somebody else. You know, and, and that sort of thing. So, um, what do you think, Sue? Do you think it will be all? You think it will be better when we don't have all the tourists in Door County? I think. I don't think it's going to make a lot of difference because so it spreads so much across the state. It's just, yeah. it's just here. It's not their fault. Uh, even if we wanted to play play the blame game, uh, it's, yeah, it's not no, their fault. I, I, <clears throat> I think someone asked if, if I asked in here um, if I noticed with with so many positive cases, are you seeing any patterns? And you can speak to like you said, group, uh, uh, weddings, mm -hmm. funerals that are large numbers of people. So that's mm -hmm. the commonality: mm -hmm. is large groups of people, variability in mask wearing. That's what we're seeing all the positives. Mm -hmm. So I don't think I can honestly say, and you correct me, that tourism, which is a good, a pleasant surprise. I, I don't think tourism has caused a huge issue. I really don't. But do you think? Not, not identifiable yeah, by any, not of, evident, uh, you so. know, any of our cases. Yeah. Know. I mean, travel and the more people you interact with, that certainly doesn't help. Yeah, yeah. We know that. Yeah. Um, someone asked, I've got to find it. And do we recommend that schools close for the two weeks following holiday breaks to protect the community from those who choose to travel? I think we recommend that you don't travel. Yeah, I don't. Um, yeah, you know, it's we really have to think about who we're spending time with within six feet and and any length of time and whether you're wearing a mask or not all the things we just talked about. Yeah. So it's it's upsetting, but we do have to revise those plans this year. Yeah. And we're all tired of it. I sort of, 
you know, I, it, especially a couple of weeks back when we truly were the hot spot of the nation, you know, it, it's I sort of jokingly sort of said, you know, you know, is it okay to travel? I'm like, well, anywhere you go is gonna be better than here. Right. As far as the, you know, so, yeah. and, and that's still to some degree not entirely inaccurate, but I think mm -hmm. if you, you know, I think the pragmatist in me would say, you know, I don't know that it's worth, I don't think it's worth closing schools for two weeks to protect against maybe the half a dozen, um, um, uh, I can't think of a word I want to use, um, dummies that would, or whatever, would, would choose to be so careless. I mean, if you're going to fly anywhere, you're, 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 you have to wear a mask. I mean, that's just the way it is. Um, so I don't know that I would want to close schools for the sake of a few, um, but I, that, I haven't thought that through. So let's see what else we have. Oh yeah, Audrey, good, good, good catch. In fact, as soon as I said it, I, I thought this. Um, uh, she just hated hearing me say, "Assuming we believe the test," um, and and uh, what I meant by that is, um, believe the test in the right context. Whenever you test anything in medicine, it doesn't have to do with the actual test. It has to do with any test. If I test for a liver level in a patient where it doesn't make sense. The number doesn't have the appropriate context. So that's what I meant. But I knew the minute it came out of my <laughs> mouth, I thought that, so good catch. I, I don't mean to suggest that we don't believe the tests. Not true. It's just, again, so much in medicine is context. And you know, it's, it, whenever you test for something, you have a question you wanna, you wanna answer. And when you get that answer, what am I gonna do with that information? And so those are the important factors. So I hope that hope that helps. Um, let's see. Yeah, I, what about college kids who will go home for winter break? I, that's a tough. I, I don't even know how to. Right. Okay. Yeah, I mean it, it's hard. I mean I think. It's it's difficult. These these are all. That's why there, so much of this is is complicated, and there's mm -hmm. no easy answers. And it'd be nice if, you know, someone's. What about college kids? Well, don't come home. Well, you're not going to say that. No. I mean, you know. Um, so I, I think, think if I was at high risk and I was <coughs> someone, um, coming home from college and I had a health condition, I would want them to quarantine or yeah. stay away. I would stay away from them, distance myself, and be very careful. Um, so every family is going to be different. Uh, my friend had COVID several weeks ago. Now her husband has it, and they still sleep together. Could she still spread COVID to others from sleeping together? Let me just read this again. My friend had COVID weeks ago. Now her husband has it. So um, there is this concept that the CDC has stated that once you're positive, you probably have some degree of immunity for about 90 days. Uh, we don't know that for, for certain yet, but the, the CDC and everyone else, we use that to sort of know that, okay, within 90 days, if someone has the sniffles or has a cold or mild symptoms, you don't have to retest them because it likely isn't COVID. Um, so I think in the context of what you stated, if the wife had it weeks ago, now husband has it, she probably is immune to it and won't spread it. Um, that's, would you agree to that? Yeah, as long yeah. as she's out of her 10 day isolation right. period and no symptoms and all that. Yeah. Yep, yep. Uh, let's see. Do I think the weather will slow it down or increase it? They thought the heat would kill it before. Yeah, you know, there were a lot of people, a um, lot of thinkers in medicine that that I um, think very highly of that really were thinking that we might see uh, a, a slowdown over the summer because typically in, in a general sense, viruses in general, they don't like heat, they don't like humidity, um, they don't do well when they're out in the open air. So the thought was um, maybe it would die down a little bit and it would get worse in the, in the fall. And in fact, we didn't see that at all. So I think the big thing, I don't know that the weather so much does anything directly to the virus. I think what does happen is the colder weather drives people indoors. 
And once again, that combination of, of people cramming together in, in tight spaces um, uh, uh, with, with bad ventilation, you know, everyone, everything closed up, the furnace is on, I think that's where the virus can, can be more apt to spread. So I don't think the temperature has a direct effect as much as it is the, the circumstances that that temperature tends to, to do. And of course, we got the ultimate insult, was it yesterday? When it snowed, oh, <laughs> I mean that's, oh. <laughs> you know, it's like it, I guess that's very 2020 of the weather, isn't it? You know, let's it have is. early snow before before Halloween. Yeah, my dog was thrilled, but not me, not so much. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <clears throat> um, I might have missed it, but can people now get? Um, yeah, someone said I might have missed it. Can people get tested if they don't have symptoms? Um, we're still not doing asymptomatic testing. Um, I think, as I said, Purveya down in, in uh, Green Bay and in the air in that area, they're doing asymptomatic testing. Um, so I believe you can go down there. Uh, I think my what I what I've heard, and I don't know if Sue can speak to it. I, the the National Guard too, they want symptomatic, but I don't think that they're in. They're not looking to turn people away. Exactly. So um, for, for whatever that's worth. Right. Well, you know, it's six forty-five. My voice is starting to go, <clears throat> starting to cough. So, which has to do with COVID, has to do with the fact that I have reflux because I drink Coke. Just, just want to say that. <laughs> just want to say that. So, um, any, any uh, last thoughts, Sue? Yep, I'd like to wish everybody a happy, safe Halloween. Please, if you're gonna go out trick or treating, don't go in a group. Avoid crowds. Stay six feet apart and away from others outside your household. Exactly. Yeah. We don't Wear want, your mask. We don't want darkness to fall across the land. So <laughs> I have to be silly. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for, for joining us. Uh, really appreciate all the good questions. Um, and I, I wish you all the best. Uh, stay safe and stay well.